then yes, housing go ahead. policy and prioritize Prop 1. Yes. Proper housing is an essential part of decent human rights and the development of a just society. For those of us who have proper housing, we can be virtually blind to the plight of those who do not. Mm -hmm. This was written in 2010 mm -hmm. or 2018. Do you still hold this viewpoint? Do you think anything has changed and how so? Well, I still hold the viewpoint mm -hmm. that good quality housing is a fundamental human right and uh, it needs to be catered for within the society. That is not restricted to the state building homes. There are many other ways that the provision of good quality housing could be catered for. There are, and I'll give a few examples, because certainly I, I am a, I'm agreeing, I'm holding to my earlier statement that is a fundamental human right. Some of the other ways, there is a state construction of affordable housing, which is the most obvious thing people may think of. There is rent control, which is a method of keeping a certain supply of housing at a certain level of quality and at a certain affordable price for the less well-off citizens. Our rent control system has fallen into disuse in this country. Thirdly, thirdly we have uh, the issue of uh, affordable land, what would, could be described as a shelter opportunity. We describe the housing discourse nowadays describes the whole thing as human settlements. And in fact, people like the Land Settlement Agency or the EMBD that are redeveloping the Karani lands, they are making lands available for less well-off people to acquire lands. The program was originally called Land for the Landless. Mm -hmm. And of course, under the previous administration, they took a wrong turn. They went into the long grass and we had to call it Land for Everybody because they wanted to give the land to everybody. But the, up, but, the, but the fundamental program there is to give housing lots, lots that have been surveyed, they have electricity, they have water, and they have a road going to the lot. And a person who is unable to afford a home can get a lot and start to build their own thing. So you recognize the value of sweat equity, and you can provide a better housing opportunity for people who may not be able to participate in the marketplace fully. Moving on from that, so the first three were construction of affordable housing, mm -hmm. rent controls, mm -hmm provision of affordable land. The fourth method through which you could provide a better quality and quantity of, of good quality housing in the country is uh, through financial incentives. So you have companies like TTMF or you have other companies that would be through various financial arrangements, they'd be put in a position where they could lend borrowers below a certain level of income at a very low rate of interest, the money they need to acquire a home, or in some cases to repair a home. Okay? So those are four of the sorts of programs. There's a variety of programs mm -hmm. that could exist, and there are more relatively minor examples along the way. But those are four examples of programs that could be put in place to satisfy what I described as a fundamental human right. Okay. You see? And, uh, and of course, overarching Above all of that, because we can get into, this, into, into the program of discussing an individual program for lots or for rent control and so on. But overarching as an approach is the whole question of economic and land use planning. Because there's a question of where do we build these homes? Where do we build these homes and why do we build them there? And having made the choice, because it's a choice, having made the choice to build these homes here, what are the implications of that choice? Not just the thing, but the meaning of the thing. What is the impact of that decision on the society, on the land, and on the economy? Because, for example, one of the phenomena we have, it, it's something that we become so disgusted with it and accustomed to it, we almost don't talk about it anymore, is the fact that significant parts of the country are what I call dormitory suburbs, with which, in fact, just about 85 to 95 percent of the population get up every morning at exactly the same time get ready, and they drive out of their driveway within half an hour of each other, heading more or less to one of the population centers, in this case it's Port of Spain, in this part of the world, and that neighborhood, for the bulk of the day, is like a ghost town. There may be some retirees, or someone who's sick home from work, or someone repairing a roof down the road, but the whole neighborhood is like a ghost town, and at 6, 6.30 it comes back to life. Okay, and the, the, the word we use for that, it's a dormitory suburb. So we, we went out the trouble of, of taking that land, 
putting down those roads, those water, those lights, building those homes, the street signs, painting those homes, furnishing them, and really, to a substantial extent, people just sleep in them. And uh, it, there, there's, there's, a kind of a, there's a kind of a deeper question now. It's not, one, is not, one is not questioning the choice of the Phillips family or the Ram Singh family or the Chinfad family who have to go to work in Porter Spade. And one is, not, one is not questioning that, but one is asking the point as to would there have been a different set of outcomes in terms of time, motion, stress, health, if the families along that street, the Ram Singh and the Chinfat and the Smith family, didn't have to travel to Port of Spain? What if they were living in Dabadi and they were working in Tunapuna? Would that have been different? Would there be less time on the road? Less traffic? Less lead inhaled? Less mercury? Less stress? More time with each other? More time with each other? A different type of neighborhood? Less of a dormitory? More of a neighborhood? So that is the kind of level at which the land use planning and the economic planning discourse would intervene. We have gone very far down, on, down that road in Trinidad and Tobago, and we are still on it in terms of the large-scale housing that is, that is, that is on the way at present. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of the issues being debated right now is the St. Augustine Nurseries project at Ram Goli Trace in Curep, Oblique, Valsain, which is agricultural land. There's no, there's no question about it. I mean, some people could try to fudge the issue and cloud it and so on. But smoke and mirrors is like part of our national culture. It is agricultural land that is being repurposed for housing. Okay? And uh, it raises a serious question in terms of the use of our green spaces to expand our housing stock. I think it's 12 towers that the HDC is proposing. I've not written at length on this. I will, I will do that shortly, possibly next week. The HDC is, written at, is, is proposing 12 towers there, and it's a relatively intense form of development in terms of towers of apartments for what was an agricultural community. And I have no doubt, given the arrangements HDC works with, that there will be people who want those apartments. That's not what's in question. You know, there will always be people who want those apartments. The question really is, what are we doing with the whole? As we try to advance a, 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 an important item on the agenda, good quality housing, how are we treating with the whole and, and what is the impact of that in the medium and long term on the society? We have to live here, you see? Yes, this goes back to what you mentioned about, about planning because mm -hmm. if we, there have been talks and complaints about our food import mm -hmm. bill, why then would we use agricultural land for mm -hmm. housing when mm -hmm. we could quite possibly construct these, these towers Yes. Elsewhere without interfering yes. with the agricultural land. Yeah. Well, well, you see, this is one of the interesting issues because what we need to have is is is, is a rather a rather informed perspective. So, for example, to come to your point, the point you made a very valuable point there that the question is why don't we construct towers elsewhere and and leave that land for agriculture? That was it, it, it succinctly. In Port of Spain, we have major sites that are state-owned, that are undeveloped. Why aren't we developing those? And they're not agricultural. So for instance, let's, just, let's talk about that. So for instance, there, is, uh, there are substantial lands in East Port of Spain, by which I mean east of Charlotte Street, yeah. north of the Gulf of Paria, south of the Lady Young Road south of the savannah, that, that, that rough rectangular area there. Those lands were acquired in 06 and 07 and 08 under a program by the then Prime Minister, Mr. Manning. They were acquired at public expense. I represented some of the people whose land was acquired. They were acquired at public expense to redevelop that part of Port of Spain. Okay. It was called East Bridge. It was a play in the words, East Port of Spain and behind the bridge. The whole project was called East Bridge. I, I wrote on it and I have a, lot of, have a lot of work that we did on it and so on. Now, if I take you and I drive in Port of Spain, I could tell you, you could get it on camera to look at some, where some of those lands are. They, st they stand there just with little grasses, acres and acres of land. What's happening to it? When is it going to be developed? Why are we alienating agricultural land, which is part of an advanced agricultural research program, 
when we have disused brown and the, the planning, the professional word is plan in planning is brown. We have brown land. Why should we alienate green land when we have brown land that's in the ownership of the state, available roads, lights, and water? We need to have a requestioning, a serious review of the purposes of these programs. So I'm glad you asked that question because it's, it's really an important one. So you have, East, you have the East Bridge lands coming through Port of Spain. You have the piece of land at the corner of Victoria Avenue and Trackweed Road where Desperados was playing this carnival. It used to be the government printery opposite Lapero Cemetery. That belongs to the state. What's the plan for that? Do you Power Gen property at the corner of Colville Street and Rice Road. That belongs to the state. What's the plan for that? OK? The Ministry of Agriculture property at the top of the Magnificent Seven, near to Sinclair Roundabout. It proposed, was proposed for hotel by Udicott. I don't know how advanced those proposals, how far along the road they've gone. They've attracted some, some, some interest and so on. But we need to have a big conversation about how we redevelop our capital city in, terms, in, con in conceptual terms. I don't have a problem looking at somewhere as far east as Curep as part of Port of Spain, as part of a greater Port of Spain, an outer Port of Spain concept. I don't have a problem with that conceptually. But we need to have a conversation that puts all of these elements on the table. But do you think part of the problem is the fact that the decisions are being made quite possibly by one stakeholder instead of having consultation with everybody, all stakeholders? So let's say with regards to the agricultural land in Curep there, mm -hmm. um, do you think it would help if environmentalists or people who or agricultural people, farmers, horticulturalists or whatever, mm -hmm. were to be involved in that conversation mm -hmm. instead of, mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess for want of a better with a high-handed measure where, okay, whichever sector of the, go sector of the government decides, well, okay, this is what we want, this is what we're going to do yes. without actually considering all the ramifications. Right. Well, let me, let, me, let me talk to that point. That's a really important point again. We're talking about the point about consultation. Uh -huh. And we need to make the point that consultation is only meaningful if the conversation and the explanation and the discussion takes place before decisions are taken. That was one of the findings in the off report. The off report was one of the things that myself, former colleagues, Transparency Institute, and the then backbencher, Dr. Rowley, called for. Okay. The off report was, effect it was effectively Dr. Rowley's epic moment. We got a commission of inquiry. The commission of inquiry, in more ways than one, vindicated the positions Rowley took. Okay? The report of that commission of inquiry is an important part of the history of this country. And one of the recommendations in that report is that, in fact, when you're doing large-scale projects, there must be consultation with stakeholders. And the decisive word is, before decisions are taken. So we, have, we, are, we are really dealing with a philosophical and a moral question. What is this incapacity of ours to learn? If you were speaking to a classroom of children, you would say they are hardened. Why won't we learn? Why won't we listen? The information is there. We've done the work. Those of us who participated in the Commission of Inquiry, including Dr. Rowley, we did the work. It was a lot of work. We have the findings. Now let's use it. Let's build a better country. Let's do better than the last time around. The bad old days, let's try to move into the good old days. So this is, this is a very valuable exchange. I thank you. <laughs> thank you. OK, so back to the point of um, proper housing being an essential part of decent human rights. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people in Trinidad and Tobago who are trying, who dream of owning their home. Yes. We have the HDC who mm -hmm. is constructing a lot of houses all over the country. Yes. And for a very long time, they stay empty mm -hmm. till some of them go to different stages of dilapidation. Why, wh where is the disconnect? How do we bridge the gap um, between the people who want these houses, these houses that are being constructed and then left empty? Okay. Well, j just to step back a bit, Ms. Batiste, to say to you firstly that the, the mission, in terms of fulfillment of mission, the mission of the HDC and it's embedded in the HDC Act and it's embedded in the housing policy. The mission is to actually provide a 
affordable housing for low and middle income. Mm -hmm. My own belief is that middle should not have been there, but it's there. Now, the way it's written tells a story. If when you're writing this sort of thing, a policy or law, you say low or middle, it is the natural, unchallengeable implication that you're giving priority to low, and the first priority to low, and the second priority to middle. The housing program that HDC is on, and that they've been on for the last 15 years, is a housing program that has been attempting, to put it succinctly, to fortify the middle class home ownership in this country. It has had very little to do with low income people or poor people. And for that reason, I believe HCC, and this is not to do with the current administration, because it's 15 years, I said. Mm -hmm. it, the first policy actually was born in September of 2002. So it's about 15 and a half years now. And the point I'm making is that that drifting away from the policy goals has occurred under a number of administrations. Because what they have built, time and again, by and large, is houses for sale. And if you're familiar with the income in this country, the actual income, not the imaginary income, not the Facebook income, not, not the old talk we give each other, the actual real income of the people in this country, is not that high. Over 70% of the population, the, the, the households in the country, have a household income of less than, less than $8,000 a month. So any building houses for $800,000. And seven fifty and nine fifty and you're doing Victoria Keys and all these everything is everything is some upper level thing. You never hear them go on TV and say, We built two hundred homes and these are low income homes for rent. You never hear that. For some reason that never gets any conversation. The poor person and the low income person who is named first in the housing policy and in the H D C Act, Act number twenty four of two thousand and five. Those people are never mentioned on TV when they keep in a big press conference. So they have a baby and they're giving out keys because it's the houses that people are buying. Think about it. So the actual engine that, that you were inviting me to comment on, that engine is the HDC, is the, is the, is the agency, statutory agency is the professional word for it. The HDC is the agency that implements the housing policy. They're the implementing agency. They're the ones who get the land and get the contractors and put up the houses and the apartments and the roads and the lights and the water and all of that. But quite frankly, they're not doing their work because their work is prescribed by law in the Housing Development Corporation Act. It isn't what I say, it's, in, it's by law. That law was passed in 2005 and we know who was in government then. Dr. Rowley was the housing minister at the time, okay? The housing policy was put in place in September 2002 and the housing minister at the time was Senator Danny Montano. The housing policy of 2002 has never been reviewed or withdrawn. It was reviewed, the, the allocation policy was slightly reviewed at the end of 2007. I correct myself in terms of the percentages. That policy has been removed from all official websites. You will find it on my website. If you go to afroraymond.net, you will find it. But as we say in Trinidad and Tobago, for whatever reason, it exists only in memory, unless you come to afroraymond.net. Same thing with the land use policy. We actually have a land policy in this country from 1992. We have a land and agriculture minister who's a very informed person. When he was writing in the Express, I thought he was the best columnist in the country, Clarence Rambarat. Very learned. The land policy has also disappeared. It doesn't exist in any official website. And why is that? The land policy actually speaks to this question as St. Augustine Nurseries. The land policy actually says that agricultural land should not be alienated for permanent development. Huh. So you see, if you publish the land policy and you publish the housing policy, Officially, sort of weird the public, and this is not again. It's not this criticism of mine is not 
isolated to this administration. It is years those things have been made to disappear. If you publish those policies, the public and people who wish to know, because not everybody will read the same thing. You may be doing your research and you want to find out more and you go and you look and you see it. And you go to the part about this and you read the part about that and you make sense, you pick sense from nonsense. But in today's world of an information torrent, you can make important documents disappear as an irresponsible act of administration. In a progressive society, we should not be doing that. You can make those items disappear. But to what end? And then, I'll tell you. And then you can do what you want. It's like Alice in Wonderland. The thing is what I say it is. So we build in plenty house. And we gain out plenty lots. Just like the last lot was given out plenty lots. Land for everybody. This lot is building plenty houses. Who are you building them for? What is the purpose of the exercise? We have, to, we, have a, we have an educated society here. We have to behave like educated people. And the point I'm making is that if you had the policy published officially and available for the public, which is how it ought to be, if you had the policy published, yeah, sorry. If you had the policy published and available on official websites, and the policy was in fact something you wished, you as an administration, wished to change, which is entirely in your rights. You've been elected, there was an election, there was a process, you were the government, and you could decide this is how we used to have a policy on housing. But well, that is a policy we used to have on passports. And you could change it if you want. But in fact, reviewing a policy requires that you approach the process from an evidence-based approach. You have to gather the facts. You have to make an argument why it is. This is how we were doing it, and this is how we want to do it now. And quite simply, the people we have in administration now, irrespective of who is who and what is what, and the yellow and the red and the green and all of that stuff, they couldn't be bothered. They want to build plenty of house and give out plenty of land. And they couldn't be bothered. It's, it's a process. And those processes, about the white paper and the green paper, and presenting a policy and having consultation, and after having a consultation, before you make up your mind what you want to do, to hear what people are already saying. Those processes are actually quite bothersome. So they go through them at a minimal kind of level. They've had three consultations now um, uh, for the for the St. Augustine thing. And uh, I expect they'll be proceeding with it. The, the language all appears to be very clear. I mean, they're like, they know exactly what they're doing. But the first thing that came out is that they're building 12 towers and they knew, exa they knew exactly what they were doing. So they, they appear to have made up their mind. So it's a pretty serious thing. I think that, um, I think that the, The housing issues we're facing are deep. I don't think building homes that are fully fitted, which is the which is the dominant approach at the moment. I don't think that is necessarily the best use of our limited taxpayers' dollars. It's the one that we see the most of. But like many things in life, we have to retain the capacity as thinking people to reevaluate what we're seeing and ask the hard questions, is that the best use of those dollars and cents? And the answer is no. One of the proposals I made at a forum on housing some time ago, an official forum on housing that they invited some of us to speak at, was that in fact we need to recognize what we call sweat equity, which means that we have two models working in the country now to, to, to simplify it. We have a model over here, which is the HDC model, which in fact a state agency with get land, pay an architect, pay an engineer, get a contractor to put out a tender, put up homes, roads, water, lights, and then distribute those homes. So you have a fully fitted home, yes, with kitchens and bathroom and everything. Over here, we have another model, which is the land settlement agency or the EMBD model, where in fact all they're dealing with is land. So there's a lot of land in different parts of the country and they put down roads, water, lights, and uh, they survey the lots, they get planning permission, and they would distribute lots. That's all you're getting, a lot of land. So there's a, there, there are two models, house and land, 
for an apartment and lots. What about that model in the middle? Why can't we have a model image where we construct is a shell? So you give someone who maybe could not afford to get a fully fitted home, you give someone a shell. Four walls, a roof, floor slam, doors and windows. They don't have builder proof in. They have like one bathroom fitted, they have a sink in the kitchen and that's it. And they, over the course of time, they can improve the house and fix it the way they want to. Because people have got family and friends that will help them to fix the houses. Yeah. It's very interesting when you go back to some of these social housing developments, whether it's Diamond Vale or River Estate or Pleasantville. And you see Signal Hill in Tobago, five years and ten years after. The rapid and really impressive improvements people, some people have made to their homes. That was an affordable housing scheme. Ten years before. We all see it and we don't think it through. But that's what it is. That is sweat equity coming into play. Somebody said, I don't want my kitchen to be like this. I want to fix my kitchen like that. And so, well, in fact, let's put it into play at an earlier stage of the game. And the house will be selling for half a million dollars. Maybe you could let somebody have that house for 350 If you cut all those things out. Mm -hmm. So we have to have different ways to approach the target. But one of the fundamentals you must not discard and must not forget is that rented housing has to be part of the conversation. It can't be a part of the conversation that's never discussed. We have to get away from this because what is taking place here between the administrations, there's a concerted effort to fortify the middle class home ownership. That is what is taking place here. So what happens to the poorer members of society? At what point do we start to address their need for affordable housing? Well, I'm going to keep on talking about it and keep on pushing for it. But it's a serious thing. I have to say the last house, the previous housing minister, I don't want to say the last housing minister, the previous minister was um, Randall Mitchell. And uh, Mitchell did give some statements that were very encouraging, sort of last year around September and October, about how he was going to focus on rented housing. And he was going to make that a focus because too often it had been houses for sale only and so on. Mm -hmm. I had one meeting with him and um, that went fairly well. And of course now he's gone. So he's at tourism. So I hope he does well there. But there's one person out of the last 15 years who at least seemed to have understood what was the shape of the thing and spoke to it. Okay. Now, that was Mitchell. Yeah, he, yeah, he spoke with some clarity and he said, no, we have to stop doing this and we have to stop doing that. And he's, it was pretty impressive. I was pleased to meet him. Okay. But he's gone. I wish him well. He's elsewhere now, you know. So focus on a new renting a little mm -hmm. bit, right? Um, does the HDC have a measure in place where, like, rent to own? There is a rent to own program, yes. How does that work? The rent to own program operates in a way that you, there are two, there are two programs. There's a rent to own and there's a license to own. Rent to own is when you can't afford at this point to buy, the, to buy a house. But we will give you X unit. You will move in and you will pay, they will set a rent for you. And after a certain amount of time, let's say it's five years, they will review because you may have finished your degree, gotten a promotion, you know what I mean? You may have done other things to improve your, your financial situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they will review your situation in five years and so you pay any rent regularly for five years. And if at the end of the five years they find that you are now in shape to buy this house at what is the value that they're selling it to you at, they would credit you, I think it's about 75 or 85%, it's not all of the rent. That, that you pay. paid mm -hmm. to be credited towards the house. So that is part of the calculation in five years' time. The other scheme they have is something called a license to own. And the license to own is a little more involved. In a license to own, you were ready, willing, and able to buy the house that they had for sale. And you went and you signed and you paid the deposit. But they weren't ready because something was wrong with their paperwork. Normally, something to do with title. If they weren't ready, they don't want to lose you. So they give you the keys, which is what they do on TV, they give you the keys and they put you in your house. When you see the people getting keys and things, a lot of it is be that. So you get the keys and you move in. And you start paying a rent, but they call it a license. That's why it's called license to own. It's not a rent, it's license to own. You start paying a rent to HDC, a license fee to HDC for occupation of the house that you have a contract to buy. At a, at a, at a particular price that was set in the contract. Eh? And after, whenever it's ready, 
the problem that they had is so it's not, it's not your problem because eh? you have your mortgage letter from GTMF and everything. Eh? You're not the one in problem. They are the one who have a difficulty, not you. Whenever they're ready. So in two years' time, they may come and say to you, okay, we're ready to go ahead now, Miss Batiste. All the rent you paid will go towards while. it, right? So those are the two programs that HGC has operating to answer your question. Okay, and on the issue of rent, let's talk about mm -hmm. Rent Assessment Board. Hmm. Do we have one in Trinidad and Tobago? Is it still functional? No, no. With the Rent Assessment Board, um, sort of with other Nivina, because we used to have Rent Assessment Boards for districts in the country. Mm -hmm. So there was a Rent Assessment Board for Port of Spain, there was one for San Fernando, Arima, Chaponas. There were different, the main municipalities in the country had Rent Assessment Boards. And their jobs, you know, in accordance with the Rent Assessment Laws, with uh, the people could apply and apply to have a rent set, to have a rent reassessed if the person had improvements and so on. And it was a measure of control that was exercised on the rents charged by private landlords to private tenants. That system, that set of arrangements, because there's a law at the top and then people have to be appointed and then the, uh, the board is appointed as a meet. And there's a whole set of things that have to happen, which is why I call it arrangements. That set of arrangements have, have collapsed. So in fact, I would, I would trace it back about it, I've also written also about this, but it's not, it's, again, it's not something that interests many people. But I'll trace it back to about, I would say to about 04, 03 and 04, that the boards, because it's a very funny thing, eh, about administrative moves. I think what they did is they didn't appoint any more boards. So the way that boards are appointed, you have a term of office. So if I appoint four people to a board, and uh, their term of office is three years. And I find in some way they are being inconvenient to me. Or their activities is causing a set of things to rise up that I don't particularly approve. But I just appointed it for them because it was something that everybody before me had done. And I want to and I want to sort of curtail that discomfort I'm feeling. There are different ways you could approach it. You could do like some of the politicians nowadays do and fire the board. You keep a thing and say you're shocked to find all this and bring them on TV and join select committee and say you're surprised to see this and you didn't realize that this man or I can't make a whole thing for them. You could go to parliament and change the law. Like as I said, openly review the policy. Mm -hmm. Or you could do what they did with the rent assessment board. Do a Sir Humphrey and just don't reappoint anybody. So when the thing dies out, it dies out. When it's dead, it's dead. Don't reappoint anybody. So no thought being spared at all to the persons being affected by these ridiculous rents. Yeah, yeah, just, just don't appoint anybody. I just let it slide. And that, that is what happened with that. You know? So the law is still there. And nobody changed the law. But the actual arrangement to protect your rights has been allowed to, to wither on the vine because it's stopped watering the plant. So as someone See, who is renting, this is renting, how uh -huh. so, so, so that went on. So if I encounter problems, then what form of redress is there? Well, as far as I'm aware, the only redress you would really have in terms of private landlord uh -huh. situation would be some kind of litigation, which is an extremely expensive, expensive yeah. time-consuming thing. And most people literally can't afford to litigate. It takes too much time and money. And believe me, as somebody who's litigated a lot of times, it's a tremendous amount of stress. It really is. I mean, it's like you won't even understand how stressful the amount of lies and things that you have to put up with. You know, we have good courts, but it's a lot of stress. So, so there, was a, there, was, there was a cheap, effective, it wasn't perfect, but it was a cheap and effective system in place to safeguard the rights of those private renters. And that system has been allowed to, to wither on the vine. I say, if you stop water any plant, so no but matter that, what angle they look at this thing from, it seems that the administration is really not seeking the interests of the poorer members of society because these are the people who would be renting and these are the people who would be time and time again taken advantage of by... I know. I know. And you see, Ms. Bertiz, this, this point we are in the discussion now is really... It illustrates it's like a window. You're walking down a corridor and you walk in that way. And you may get a call on your phone and you stop. And you take the call. You go in there. And while you're talking, you do so. 
and they actually have a window here looking out into the whole thing there. We are actually at that point in the corridor. Because what this moment illustrates is why is there so much opposition to the property tax? Because the property tax, as as proposed, mm -hmm. is really a very minor tax. I mean, I give all the examples. Some of them is, is $80 a month. When you work it out, $100 a month. For a good house in a good area. So what is all this thing about? What is, why is everybody so upset? upset? And what it is is this. Is that in this society, we have a tax system. I'm talking about the border bill and revenue here. That is not very effective. Okay. I mean, have you ever heard of anybody in Trinidad and Tobago going to prison and not paying their taxes? I haven't. Have you heard of anybody in Trinidad and Tobago losing their property because they didn't pay their taxes? I haven't. Okay. No. These are, just think about these things mm -hmm. because, uh, trust me, the advanced countries you like to talk about, people do go to prison. Eh? And it doesn't matter how wealthy you are and so on, you will, you will go to prison. You will, go, you will go down and you will go to prison for years and years and years. It doesn't happen here. And, and again, let's talk about the arrangements. So what happens is this. If you are an independent professional, or you're a sole trader, you own your own company, you own a hardware, you own a company with trucks, you're a DJ, you paint houses, you're a professional, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a lawyer. I mean, I use, I use lawyers all the time. There's only three lawyers in Port Spain never give me a receipt. Okay. It's serious. I see. I don't know who the three are. I'm very happy that you all gave me receipts. The other ones you have to run them down and run them down and run them down to get a receipt. Okay. And the people who make those money so they don't pay in taxes on, they don't leave it in the bank. Because of the bank, you're getting a quarter of a percent and half a percent. You're getting no money in the bank. Inflation is eating you out. Every month you leave your money in the bank, inflation is eating you out. So they buy property, they buy land, they buy apartments. If they have a property, they improve their property. So they have a house upstairs and put two apartments downstairs and so on and so on. And then they rent those properties. Or the land that they flip it and they sell it. The, the apartments they rent them and they have investment income. Which does not appear on their tax return. What the property tax system will do, and I'm saying will do because it has to happen in terms of once that system goes in place, it will actually create a database where with no great no great stress. You could stay on your phone. And if there's somebody in public life, if there's somebody in public life that you find the person to be intriguing, you say, well, hold on, this XYZ person. You could actually stay on your phone and look and see how many properties they own. You could see how many properties they're renting and what are they renting them for because the property tax system would require all of that information to be available and for all of it to be searchable. So for the first time, the concealed affairs of people who habitually don't pay tax, let us, let us say plainly what it is, people who habitually do not pay tax, which is a crime in this country, albeit it is a crime that the courts haven't convicted anybody for. People who, who habitually evade taxes, their affairs would be exposed completely by a proper property tax system, which is going to the heart of what you are talking about. Okay. So that is really how the two things link. So you stop and look out the window. <laughs> you, can, you can see here from here. That's where we are in the corridor. We can go along walking on the corridor a little more. Now. Okay. As we prepare to, to wrap up, mm -hmm, um, sure. how do we, do you have any Recommend, recommendation, how do you propose that we go about what amendments should be made to the housing policy to income pass to cater to all members of society and not just the middle and the higher class? Well, the main housing, the main change to the housing policy should be that it should focus the resources on lower income members of the, of the society. The second thing that should happen, because you made a very tantalizing point just now, you said to, to, to focus on all. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be an explicit statement about housing, what I call housing subsidy. You see, housing subsidy exists across the board. If the agency builds a house that should sell for a million dollars, 
and they're selling it to people for six fifty. That three hundred and fifty thousand dollar difference that you would have paid if you bought it from a private developer, but you did not pay it because you got it from HTC. That three hundred and fifty thousand dollars is a housing subsidy that the state handed you. If that same house was not sold, it was rented, and it would have rented for seven thousand dollars a month. But the HDC in his housing policy rented to you for three thousand dollars a month. That four thousand dollars a month is housing mm -hmm. subsidy. When TTMF and these companies are making mortgages at two percent and they're including appliances and some of them have no deposit and so on, that beneficial funding is possible because of support from the Treasury. But we don't have an explicit conversation in terms of national housing policy that would take account of all of those things. So the actual quantity and the distribution of housing subsidy needs to be recorded for us to start to have a proper conversation about housing policy. So that, that'll be those are my two recommendations. The, the actual housing policy as executed by HDC needs to be focused on the needs of lower income people who can only afford to rent. And in terms of national housing policy linked to economic policy, we need to have housing subsidy calculated and disclosed so we can make a better use of it going forward. Okay, great. Well, Mr. Riman, thanks so much for sharing your insight. Thank you. And you can expect to hear from me again because sure. I'm sure I need clarification as I go thanks forward. Thanks very much. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having me.